Well, blessed Sunday to you as we come on your third Sunday after the Epiphany. And uh, it is a cold one for us here in Minnesota. If you're tuning in from uh, other parts of the United States, welcome in Jesus' name. We are in the midst of the season of proclaiming Jesus as the light of the world. And I guess the prediction is has been every every day we gain about two more minutes of sunlight and it just will keep on increasing and so was the light of Jesus born in Bethlehem increasing around the world and so it is in the epiphany season we celebrate the progress of that light and proclaim the good news to all nations we're going to hear the challenge of that the challenge is not something that always comes from the outside. There are many places around the world where there are political unrest, but sometimes the suppression of the gospel, the suppression of love, comes from inside of us. And that's where the story of Jonah is so important. We're going to hear from Jonah. We're going to hear also our gospel text, a familiar one from Mark 1. And all of them had to deal with the status of our hearts. Where are our hearts in the evangelism of the world? But let us begin with a brief order of confession and forgiveness. And so we begin in the power, in the name of the Blessed Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you join with me in prayer? In the presence of God, who sees our hearts and our minds, let us confess our sin. God, our strength, we confess that we have sinned against our sisters and brothers and against you. We cherish the values of this world. We cause others to stumble. The earth is wounded by our excess. Have mercy, O God, forgive us, renew us, and raise us up on eagles' wings, that we may do our your will with courage and delight. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, God has forgiven us all our sins. And so as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you join with me in prayer? Almighty God, by grace alone, you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your Spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading, and the primary one of our reflection today, will be Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and verse 10. First in introduction, the book of Jonah is a comedy in many cases, starring a reluctant prophet who is given one sentence message. Nineveh will be destroyed in 40 days. Much to do Jonah's dismay, the people of Nineveh repent. The point of the story is to get the reader to wrestle with the question, on whom should God have mercy? Now beginning with verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the prophet of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. 
My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel for today comes from Mark chapter 1. First, the introduction. Before Jesus calls his first disciples, he proclaims a message that becomes known as the gospel or good news from God. God is ready to rule our lives. Those who realize this will respond with repentance and faith. Beginning with verse 14, Mark chapter 1. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were there in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and hired men, with the hired men and followed him. My friends, this is the good news, the gospel of the Lord. In our introduction to the book of Jonah, it says that this is a comedy. And in the fit of genre of literature, you could say it is. I do not want to deny the factual basis on which Jonah is based. Jesus refers to it and is probably the most famous part of Jonah running away from the will of the Lord. Almost as far as you could go from the direction of Nineveh. In fact, Jonah wants to go to a place that is far east, or God is calling Jonah to a place that is far east, and in a very comedic way, Jonah goes to the complete opposite direction to Tarshish, which many scholars believe was in Spain. If Nineveh was near Baghdad, which it was, and Tarshish was near Spain, you could see that in the Mediterranean world, this was as far as Jonah could travel. And in a comedic way, Jonah goes the opposite. In a comedic way, God allows a great fish to swallow him up. And in a comedic way, Jonah starts over again in chapter 3, although, as it says in the text, with a lot of big fish vomit on him. We have had a lot of speculation about the whale or the fish, or however you term the Hebrew term for it. In fact, Jesus refers to Jonah being in the will three days and makes a reference to his own resurrection. We do not want to disregard the groundedness of this event. But the greater event of the book of Jonah is found in chapter 3 and 4, and it is the attitude of Jonah, the lack of love that Jonah has, and a model, unfortunately, of sometimes the lack of love that we have for those that are not claimed by God, or one would say, not claimed by God yet. The Ninevites were human, just like the Israelites. The Ninevites had become a great nation and had, in the course of time, become enemies of the people of Israel. Jonah was not immune to that dislike. Not unlike Nathaniel wondering about Jesus coming from Nazareth and asking the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jonah wondered the same thing. But yet Jonah knew the heart of God. 
And in this case, the heart of God was not to his liking. In many parts of the book of Jonah, also in a very comedic way, he seems to mock the grace that has established Jonah and the nation of Israel. How does he mock it? He says to God, to his face, as a prophet of the Lord, Lord, I always know that you're merciful. I always know that you change your mind if people repent. But I'll go and do this preaching. And so Jonah, at least in the section that we have, goes to Nineveh, preaches like I would, and not only believes himself to be a success, it is evidence that he is a success because, as it says, the entire city of Nineveh repented and turned from their wicked ways. Now, Nineveh was the capital city of the Babylonian Empire. I don't know what the numbers were, but it seemed when it says in the Bible that the entire town repented, it literally means the entire town repented. And if I was involved in the hand of God doing that type of thing, I would have been very delighted, not only that God had called me, but that the evidence that God was with me was the success of the turning of the people. But we know from reading the book of Jonah that this is not where the story ends. In fact, I think this is the greater part of the message of Jonah, aside from the famous fish swallowing him. It is the status of Jonah's heart. Jonah obeyed God finally, after taking a great detour. Jonah obeyed God by preaching to the people of Nineveh, and the people responded with repentance. It even includes that not only did the people repent, but that the animals repented, once again showing its very comedic understanding. Because even in the Old Testament, <coughs> only humans repent. Animals don't need to. They are not out of sorts with their creator. They are not out of sorts with creation. But they also repent. People put sackcloths on them in the story, too. But there's one person who seems to have not repented, at least in their heart. Yes, he was finally obedient. But that person was Jonah. Jonah still wanted to live with his grief. Jonah wanted to still live with what he perceived as the injustice of a people that had persecuted, if not put down, the people of Israel. And Jonah, even though he should have been examining his own heart, was not impressed by the mercy of God, in fact, wondered why God was so merciful. And so in the story that we don't have in our reading, he stands opposite the people of Nineveh. There is a little plant that gives him coverage. It seems to grow in a day. I don't know what plant it is, but we'll go with the story. It covers his head. But then after a day, it shrivels up and dies, and the coverage does not help. It burns his head. We assume that Jonah is bald, and he gets depressed. Even though he was part of God's movement, even though he had preached a sermon that had a greater return rate than any Billy Graham crusade, he still is wondering why God is so merciful. And so he reminds Jonah, and the book ends with a question. 
I created the whole earth. I created all people of the earth. I even created the people of Israel, of whom you are part of, Jonah, and I created you. Shouldn't I be more concerned with the state of souls than with the state of a stupid plant that covered you for a day and was gone the next day? And so the question is left for you and I. What are the most important things of life? Who are the most important in God's sight? And what do I need to do to repent, to truly turn from the intentions of my heart? Well, one of the ways that we might repent is to acknowledge that God has created all of humanity in his image. I've mentioned this before, one of the songs I remember from childhood, even going back to when I was a three- and four-year-old, was Jesus loves the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves all people. Missions are for all people. And they involve the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. They offer the message of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And so our attitude needs to be one to realize that the amazing grace that we preach is also the amazing grace by which we stand. And when we mock it, when we mock God, when we say that those people or those Others that have hurt me are not worthy of that salvation. We mock the very message we are called to preach. I remember it very well. I was in my early 20s. And someone I had known probably since, I think, first or second grade had come to me and asked for my forgiveness. Lately, we had become very good friends. We had become very empowered, if not um, born-again believers, converted not just by our confirmations, but by our hearts on fire for the Lord. What I remembered about Rob was that he picked on me when I was a kid. He was an athlete. I was not. And sometimes those words stung. But I was very, very touched when I found out that Rob had become a believer. But I was even more touched when Rob came up to me and asked for my forgiveness after all these years and said my heart was in the wrong place. My heart was not thinking love, but only thinking my status. And I was an easy target of the bullying that he had done. I was touched even more so. Not so much that I'd seen Rob change, but more so that I now knew that there was a God who seeks out for restoration even after all these years. Now that's a simple story, and there are many of us who are still waiting for that God of justice to make things right in our world. And we truly believe that that's what will happen on the day of judgment. God will make all things new and all things right. But oh, it's hard to live in the in-between until that is done. And it's easy to fall into the trap of Jonah and not figure in the forgiveness of God, thinking that it's just mere words. But these stories give me hope that God is working out not only mercy but justice in the midst of things we cannot understand. And our act of faith is to defy our tendency to seek justice now. Now, this is not to go against protests and making things right. We have had a long and storied history, everything from making slavery illegal to advocating for the rights of others. 
And I think that that continues as we seek justice in this world. But Jonah reminds us, too, that sometimes it is not the outside world that needs to change. It's our own heart and attitude to others that we might think are not like us, are less worthy of our grace that we have and continue to proclaim. And that the greatest way that we can shine light in the world, if we can't change the big things, is to at least change the little things of the conversion of our hearts and our minds. And that starts at the altar, where we either kneel or stand or receive the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing what a little bit of bread and wine can do. Of course, we know it's more than just bread and wine. It's the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing what a little confession and forgiveness can do. But it's part of the reconciliation plan started long ago, but finding fulfillment in the cross of Jesus Christ. And so I challenge you what this, what at least is labeled as a little comedy can do of a person who can run away and get a second chance and still not see that it is all about God's mercy and not about my status. That is the beginning point of the Christian message. While we might have different statuses in this world, while we have things that we're prideful of, including our names, our position in this world, the great equalizer is that baptismal font. The great equalizer is the table of the Lord, where each of us receives the same gift, either kneeling or standing, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins and mine. Both of our congregations are going to be receiving communion today. Both are to remind ourselves that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is the great gift. He is the great mercy. And he belongs to all. So don't let anything get in the way. I don't know if God is going to swallow you up and throw you back to the same place and ask you again, like Jonah famously did. But God might leave you with the question of Jonah, the more important question. Should I not be concerned and have mercy on the world that is around us? Mercy and call people like Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, to a mission that starts from God's mercy. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today. We ask for your blessing upon our services, our mission, and our time together. I pray for our upcoming annual meetings. We have one at Central today. We will have another one at East a week from now. I pray for your discernment. I pray for your searching spirit to not only affirm, but also to challenge us in our mission together. Bless all who are in need and let us open our hearts and minds to the needs of others. Bless us on this journey of faith. In Jesus' name, who taught us to pray so long ago, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you join with me for our psalm today? Psalm 62, beginning with verse 5. For God alone I wait in silence, truly my hope is in God. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall never be shaken. In God is my deliverance and my honor, God is my strong rock and my refuge.
Put your trust in God always, O people. Pour out your hearts before the one who is our refuge. Those of high degree are but a fleeting breath. Those of low estate cannot be trusted. Placed on the scales together, they weigh even less than a breath. Put, put no trust in extortion and robbery. Take no empty pride. Though wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it, that the power belongs to God. Steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay all according to their deeds. Thankfully for the grace of God, God doesn't always hold our deeds against us, still shows mercy and steadfast love. And my friends, know that good news today. It is for you. If you are in the sound of my voice, or whether you're near or you're far, God's mercy endures for you. We now receive the blessing of Almighty God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you today. I invite you to both Central and East, East at 8.30, Central at 10.30. Just a reminder that we do have our annual meeting tomorrow at Central. A week later, we'll have it at East. And I also want to give a thanks to Erica Cunningham, who will be covering for me at Central uh, a week from this time. God bless you, and we trust that you can trust in the mercy of God. Take care.